Good morning, church, and happy Sunday. Let us begin the day by going to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we would like to lift up in prayer our families and friends, Lord. We know that around us, or even ourselves, we may have lost our loved ones, be it due to COVID, Lord, be it to any other illness or reason. We pray, Lord, for the families left behind. We pray, Lord, for your love to cover them, Lord, and to comfort them during these times. In the same way, Lord, we would like to lift up in prayer families, Lord, that have been stricken with fear, that have been stricken with sickness, Lord. We pray for your healing. We pray, Lord, that you would lift their burdens, Lord. You would lift their spirits as well. We pray, Lord, that more than our physical health, Lord, may you also give each and every one of us the discipline during these times, Lord, to dwell in prayer, Lord, to have our devotions, Lord, and to also enjoy the company of fellow believers in Bible study, in prayer meeting, Lord. All the more that we need to strengthen our faith, Lord. We need to come before you as we are and in full surrender. Forgive us for the times that we've been stubborn, for the times that we wanted things to go our way with our direction, with our plans. And right now, Lord, the world is in chaos. The world is at a loss on how to have a workaround with this COVID, Lord, with the pandemic, with the lockdowns. And amidst all of this, Lord, we thank you for how you have been faithful, how you've been with us, how you've provided for us, Lord. And how you ensure to us, Lord, that though our flesh may fade, Lord, though this physical body be beaten, be destroyed, Lord, our life with you is what matters, Lord, is what's important. And this Sunday, Lord, may we be reminded of that. And may our hearts be prepared to listen to your word, that we may continue to grow and understand you and your word. This is our prayer, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
draw me to your side And as I wait, I rise a black eagle And I was so with you, your spirit Commit again with all I am for you, Lord. You hold my world in the palm of your hand, and I am yours forever. Jesus, I believe. I belong to you. Your reason that I live, reason that I sing with all I am. Walk with you. Good morning, love family. As we continue our worship today, let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for today that we are able to worship you once again, Lord. And thank you for the technology that enable us to worship you. And Lord, we just thank you for uh, your continuous blessing, your continuous provision, Lord your continuous protection to each one of us thank you lord for uh, guiding our church for sustaining us lord and continue to work in us and to us lord to be a blessing to other people lord we thank you that uh, you have sent your son jesus christ to die for our sins and reconcile us back to you thank you lord for in christ we have hope in christ lord we have forgiveness and despite of our current situation, Lord, 
uh, we have this joy and peace that we have that only can be found in Christ Lord and we thank you for this Lord uh, we continue to lift up our, our COVID situation uh, it's getting more and more Lord uh, the cases is, is continuing continuously rising and we just continue to lift up our brothers and sisters who have been affected by this Lord and we specifically pray for uh, the Reyes family, for Davy, for uh, Brother Dick and Sister Laura. We continue to lift them up, Lord, for your healing, for your continuous protection, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to protect each one of us, Lord, from this uh, deadly disease, Lord. Uh, yes, it's been contained. There are vaccines, yet... Uh, it's still dangerous and can cause death and Lord will continue to lift up this situation uh, to you and help us to be more disciplined Lord in tackling this uh, Lord we also pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan uh, we pray for your continuous protection to them and for the whole nation Lord we pray that you will continue to uh, keep them safe from the Taliban's and continue to uh, sustain and provide for the country. Uh, Lord, we also pray for our upcoming election and as the candidates are filing for candidacy, we pray that uh, you will uh, give them, Lord, the desire to serve the country. And I pray, Lord, that uh, as citizens, we would vote wisely and I pray that uh, what whoever wins, Lord, uh, next year will uh, continue to lead this country in the path that you want, uh, in the path, Lord, that you see. And we just pray that uh, we would be discerning and we will be responsible in how we vote, Lord. Uh, Lord, we also pray uh, for your continuous uh, guidance in our economy. Uh, it's been uh, very erratic given the possible collapse of uh, Evergrande in China with so many deaths, Lord. And these cases, Lord, we, it's unforeseen and it may have a uh, world uh, economy impact and we continue to lift this up to you, Lord. Uh, continue to guide our businessmen, our uh, economies, our financial sector, and I pray that uh, whatever the result is, Lord, uh, whatever the decisions that will be done, we continue to pray yung, uh, that they would be uh, good and pleasing into your sight, Lord. And Lord, I just pray uh, that as we uh, continue our worship today, uh, open our hearts, Lord. Speak to each one of us. May your Holy Spirit once again work in us and through us uh, that we may see the beauty of your word and apply it, Lord, in our daily lives. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, you will uh, keep us from any distraction that will hinder us as we worship Lord and may your word uh, really drive us into action we continue to pray Lord for our church continue to pray that you will use Lighthouse of Faith Tabernacle to be uh, light and salt in this world to be a blessing to others Lord and we just uh, give back all the glory to you Lord for you alone deserve it Lord and worthy of our praise. Uh, once again, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Church. Once again, we uh, come to our topic entitled Dropping Out from the School of Pharisees, and we are looking at the last part of Matthew chapter 23 today. And before we go to our passage this morning, let's try to review once again what we have learned so far. In Matthew chapter 23, we have said that Jesus actually reserved his harshest words 
for Matthew chapter 23. And these words um, were basically reserved for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. In this passage alone, in 39 verses, Jesus would say seven times he would mention the word woe. And basically it's some sort of a curse for the for the Pharisees. And he, he said this word seven times to them. Seven times he called them hypocrites. Five times he called them blind guides. Twice he called them fools. And once he called them brood of vipers. Indeed, these are very harsh words coming from Jesus Christ. And the reason he... He went to the extreme of using these words is because these Pharisees are doing something very, very wrong in the eyes of God. And that's why as Christians, we need to avoid these same mistakes that the Pharisees are doing. Exactly what mistakes were these Pharisees doing? The last time we saw the first of the three woes that Jesus gave these Pharisees. We understand last time that the first thing uh, the first woe that Jesus had for them was because these Pharisees, they were becoming hindrances to people's salvation. They were supposed to be leading people to salvation. They were supposed to be leading people to God, but instead they have become obstacles. They were preventing people from coming to know the Lord. Secondly, they were zealous for all the wrong reasons. The Pharisees indeed, when you talk about zealousness, they are really zealous. However, the problem is that they were zealous for all the wrong reasons. They were not zealous for God. They were zealous for their own traditions. And they were converting people so that not so people could come to know God, not so that people could become a Jew that is accepted by God, but rather so that these people would become um, like them as Pharisees following the traditions of the Mishnah and the traditions of the Talmud. And that's why... Jesus was angry with them because they're not really leading people to God. They're not really making people become more like God, but they were making people become like them. And Jesus called them sons of hell. Thirdly, they love to play around with the rules. They love to nitpick the rules. They love to find loopholes in the rules. And they love to avoid obeying the rules as much as possible. Although they were very strict, in demanding people around them to obey the rules, but they themselves, they 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 create certain um, traditions that would prevent that would allow them to escape certain rules, and that's why Jesus was not happy with what they were doing. And now we come to the last four of the seven woes that Jesus had for the Pharisees. The the fourth one, um, basically, Jesus was angry with them because. They were selective in their obedience. They were selective in their obedience. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Jesus was saying, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, the mint, the dill, the cumin, but you neglect the more important matters of the law justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Now understand one thing. Jesus Christ was not angry with the Pharisees that they could not follow all the rules, but rather that these Pharisees would take so much time, would take so much time focusing on laws that were not really as important. Now you have to understand that uh, there are varying degrees to importance of the law. There are varying degrees to the importance of the law. Some laws are far more important than other laws. One very good example in our, human, in our Philippine constitution, for example, the sovereignty of the Philippines is far more important than any other rules. And that's why the sovereignty of the Philippines is always the first part of our constitution. In the same way, the right to life is more important than the traffic laws. Therefore, when you are in risk of losing your life, the law is more lenient towards you when you cross the red lights. You see, there are, there are laws that are far more important than other, other laws. The right to life is more important than traffic laws. Um, the sovereignty of the country is far more important the traffic laws. And that's why Jesus was targeting these Pharisees because these Pharisees, yes, they could not obey all the law and that's a given because none of us can ever 
fulfill the complete requirement of the law. That's why we need Jesus Christ. But the Pharisees, the problem with the Pharisees is that they would rather choose this minor loss. They would put a lot of emphasis in dealing with the minor loss. Look at what, about, what Jesus Christ was saying. You give a tenth of your spices, the mint, the dill, and the cumin. For those of you who don't know what these are, basically these are spices, the cumin, the mint, and the, and the dill. What makes this very hard, especially if you're going to give a tithe to the Lord from your spices, remember God demanded the Israelites that they should give 10% of everything that God has blessed them with. And for the Pharisees, they were very strict about this. They would go to the extent of really measuring out 10% of these spices that they have at home. And guess what? It was not easy. It was not easy to measure these spices. You see, they were living in a time with, when they still do not have modern weighing scales that we have today. This is the kind of weighing scales that they used to have. And basically, if you see these golden items here in the bottom of the picture, these golden items, they are what we call the weights. And each item would have a, sp a specific weight assigned to it. For example, the bigger one could be 500 grams, and the smaller ones could be 10 grams or 5 grams. And basically, they would weigh the amount of, 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 of spices uh, using these small weights. Now, here's the problem. The Pharisees, they want to be very exact that what they give to, to the Lord is really 10%. And let me tell you, it's not easy to divide up spices. It's not easy to divide up powders into 10%. I, when I was in Tacloban, uh, we had a drugstore back then. And part of my responsibility as the son of the owner of the drugstore, I was assigned to measure out... A, um, I was assigned to measure out uh, tawas. Okay, we were selling tawas, uh, powdered tawas, and we are to put it in a plastic bag, and we are to weigh it on a wing scale. And you see, I would put that, I would put the wings, uh, I would put the weights on one part that I would exactly have about 250 grams of tawas, and on the other hand, I would have tawas. And when the the measure is right, I put them into a plastic bag and seal the bag up. Now, it was not easy, especially during the 1990s. There were no such thing, or rather, we've never heard of digital weighing scale back then. And we have to do everything by hand, and it was not easy. Now, it's what I'm doing was actually easier because I'm simply going to measure up 250 grams. The difference with me and the Pharisees is that they have this bulk, and they're going to bring it down to 10%. And that was not easy. And the Pharisees, they were very peculiar. It has to be exactly 10%, not 1% more, not 0.1% more. They want to give God exactly what God was asking 10%. I'm reminded of a sister, a sister in the Lord, a sister in the Lord who is very peculiar with the payment that he's paying the government offices or utilities, for example, when she would go to Miralco, and before she would go to Miralco, she would go to the bank and have his, and have her five peso bill changed to 500 pieces of one centavo coins. Because this lady, whenever she goes to the utilities or to pay the BIR or to pay uh, SSS, she would pay everything to the cent. She would not pay one cent more. She would not pay five cents more. And I would often tell her, you know what? It's okay to pay five cents more. It's okay to pay 10 cents more. It's okay to round up your payment because it gets credited to your next account. But she doesn't believe in that. And what she would do is she would really count out the exact amount to the, to the cent and go and pay the bank with it. And you know, the bank or, or they would, the, the utility... Um, establishments, the SSS, PhilHealth, they're not happy about receiving one centavo coins. They're not happy at all because it's, it, it shows that this person that they're dealing with is someone who is very peculiar about little things, nitpicking the very small items. But that's exactly what the Pharisees are doing and it's not easy dealing with them. 
they were following the law to the very letter that it has to be exactly 10%. And doing so, remember, as I said, they don't have digital weighing scale. And therefore, weighing out 10% of their spices takes a lot of time out of them. They could have used that time doing other ministries. They could use that time doing uh, obeying other laws that God has commanded them to obey. But instead, they're wasting that time to measure out exactly 10% of each of the spices. Can you imagine if you have 10 spices at home, if you have pepper, salt, sugar, and you measure out 10% of each and every one of them and give them to the Lord, it takes a lot of time. And that's the problem with the Pharisees. But we have before before we start condemning the Pharisees, we need to understand that this did not actually start with the Pharisees. This did not actually start from the with the Pharisees. Indeed, the Pharisees they're not doing the more important aspects of the law. But you see, all of us we are guilty of this. You go to the Bible, you understand as early as the time of Isaiah. Isaiah was already scolding the people. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 11 to 13, he was reprimanding the people. God was reprimanding the people. God said, The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and fat of the fattened calves. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts, stop bringing meaningless offerings. And again, he went on to say, your incense is detestable to me. New moon sabbaths and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Now take note, during the time of Isaiah, the people were doing what God has commanded them to do. They were bringing their tithes. They were bringing their sacrifices. They were bringing their incense. They were celebrating these festivities that God has commanded to them to do. They were praying as God had commanded them to do. They were obeying the law of God. However, God is not pleased. Why? Because these were, although these were important, these were the least important ones. There are other more important rules or laws that they were not obeying. Look at verse 16 to 17. God says, wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Isaiah was, uh, God was reprimanding the people through Isaiah, telling them, guess what? You are focusing so much on things that are not as important. Focus rather on things that are far more important. Focus on learning to do what's right. Focus in doing justice. Focus on defending those who needs your defense. Take up the cause of the fatherless and the widows. These are more important because it affects the people around you. This incense, this prayer, these are personal. Um, this only affects you personally. But these other things that you have been commanded to do will affect the people around you. And God was saying, Yes, all this are good. What you've been doing are good. But when you do these things and neglect these more important things, then I don't really care about these lesser things anymore. Because it shows that you don't actually want to obey me in everything that I have commanded you. The bigger things you are neglecting and you're focusing on the smaller things. Micah, who was a prophet contemporary to Isaiah, has the same words. He was telling them, He has shown you, O men, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's the very same thing that, I, that Micah was saying. He's telling the Israelites, Israelites, guess what? 
you're bringing all these sacrifices, you're bringing all this um, incense before the Lord. But guess what? What, does God, what is God requiring of you? That you would act justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. These are the more important aspects of the law that God expects you to accomplish. That's why Jesus went on uh, reprimanding them and he now, de he now calls them blind guides. You blind guides, you strain out a knot but swallow a camel. You strain out a nut, but swallow the camel. And I think that's a very beautiful picture that Jesus was saying. And when I heard this passage, I'm reminded of another passages. I'm, I'm reminded of another passage in the scriptures. This verse remind me of another verse in the Bible. And that's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? It's just a sawdust and you don't pay attention to the plank in your own eye. And Jesus Christ was saying the same thing in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3, and Matthew 23, 24. You are dealing with the small, nitty gritty aspects of the law, but you are forgetting the more important aspects of the law that affects much, that are more important. And that's why Jesus calls them blind guides. You strain out a nut, but swallowed a camel. Jesus paints a funny picture here that the israelites understand very well of course jesus was using a hyperbole where where jesus was exaggerating the picture in order to make a very valid point you see nuts are a very small are very small insects that tend to congregate um, on animals that have not been properly cleaned and that animal has no capacity of scratching their own backs so and daming nuts nyan. Okay? These nuts would congregate whether at the mouth of the animal or at the back of the animals. And usually we would find these nuts with camels, with horses, with carabaos. There will be plenty of these nuts. And Jesus Christ was now looking to the Pharisees and saying, you know what? You remove these nuts, you take away these nuts, but you're actually swallowing this camel you're swallowing the camel and he's saying you're taking out the little things you think would harm you but you're actually swallowing something bigger that can actually harm you even more you're neglecting the more important problem you're neglecting the more important law that god has given them brothers you have to understand that jesus christ was rebuking the Israelites because the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law because they were so careful not to sin in the small things of life that they miss out on the more important aspects of the law. Now let me ask you a question. Why do we tend to be selective with obedience just like the Pharisees? You see, it's a human tendency. We tend to be selective with obedience. Well, the reason we tend to be selective with obedience is because some laws are really just harder to obey than others. It's easier to give your money to the church. It's easier to give your money to the temple. It's easier to give your tithe to God than to get yourself involved in the lives of people. That's why many of our Christians would rather give to the church than they themselves going out and share the gospel. That's why many of our Christians would rather give to the church than being than going into short-term missions because when you deal with people, when you deal with justice, when you deal with mercy, when you decide to help the fatherless, when you decide to help the widows, things get messier. And that's why we don't want to obey certain laws because it's harder to obey. Another reason why we become selective with obedience is because some laws will produce persecutions. Some laws produce persecutions, especially in our day-to-day. -day. You will be persecuted by the world if you declare what the Bible actually says about homosexuality. When you stand your ground against homosexuality, you will be faced with a lot of persecutions. And that's the problem um, Senator Manny Pacquiao is having right now. He has been very adamant about homosexuality, about 
a death penalty because he believes these are biblical he believes these are in the bible and has to be and has to be followed according to the scriptures and people are uh, and this would be his downfall in the in the presidential election probably and people are now persecuting him because of his biblical stance you see some laws will produce persecutions some laws will produce persecutions some laws will cost you more some laws will cost you more that's why we become selective we choose not to obey certain laws because those laws will cost us more one very good example of this is when you pay the right taxes of course when you pay the right taxes you will have to pay more because you're paying the right taxes as opposed to just cheating through your taxes right so if you obey the law to the letter it will cost you more and lastly some laws are just simply undesirable to us that's why we we tend to be selective because we don't find this particular law desirable for us to obey for example in the philippines right now we have these face shields for many people they don't like having a face shield in fact they don't like having a face mask that's why everywhere you go you find people taking off their face mask taking off their face shield even when they are in public because it's not desirable for them to do jesus one of the command that jesus has given us as christians is that we are to love our enemies and loving our enemies is far from being desirable and that's why this is probably one of those laws that we find very hard to obey and probably this is one of that those laws that we don't take seriously in our life to love our enemies remember jonah god told jonah jonah i want you to go to the assyrians to nineveh and preach to them there and the ninevites they were enemies of the israelites these were very cruel people and jonah understood that if i go to the the people of nineveh and i preach uh, the word of god to them they might repent and god may actually relent from punishing them jonah understood that <coughs> that if i obey god these wicked people might not be punished and jonah found it undesirable that's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh instead he took a boat going the other direction to Joppa resisters understand that some laws are hard to obey some laws will produce persecution some laws will cost us more and some laws are simply undesirable to us however understand that God still expects us to obey these laws no matter what our reasons are. You see, selective obedience is not obedience at all, but disobedience. When you are selective in your obedience, you are not being obedient. You are actually being disobedient. Go through the Bible and the Bible will tell you that we are to obey God, period. No qualifications. No qualifications. Obey God if only it seems right for you obey god if it's easy for you obey god if it doesn't cost you anything we would like our laws to be that way but that's not how it works with god god doesn't want us to be selective in our obedience he wants us to obey everything that he has commanded us to do no excuses the next reason Jesus was angry with the Pharisees was because their righteousness was all but an act. Their righteousness was all but an act. Look at verse 25 to 26. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees! First, clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean also verse 27 is the uh, is the sixth woe and if you not if you notice it's actually very much similar to the fifth woe and it says woe to you teachers of the law and pharisees you hypo you hypocrites you are like whitewashed tombs which look good which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean Jesus Christ was now talking to the Pharisees and he's saying, you know what, you Pharisees, 
you clean the outside, but you 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 don't care about what's actually on the inside. You care about the outside, but you don't care about what's actually in the inside. You see, the idea of cleanness is very important to the Jews. When we think about cleanness in our time today, we think about taking out the garbage, we think about laundry, we think about sweeping or taking a bath. But for the Jews, they took the concept of cleanliness or cleanness to a whole new level. They have a long list of rules of how to keep them from being unclean. You see, for the Israelites, they were considered unclean by eating certain kinds of food. They were considered unclean by, teaching, by touching unclean objects or by being near a dead body. They become unclean when they get certain types of sickness. And that's why for the Israelites, they have a long list of ritualistic cleansing. They have to wash their food foot, they have to wash their toes, they have to wash their head. They have a lot of rules with regards to ritual cleansings because these are very important. But one thing is very clear. If you go through the list of their ritual cleansings, you understand that all the ritual cleansings have to do with cleaning what's on the outside. You are to take off your clothes, change your clothes, take a bath and change your clothes. These are all physical manifestation of, clean, of cleansings. But understand that in the law, there were no laws about cleansing what is within. You see, this is something that you cannot do physically. And that's why the Bible continues to tell them that you are to follow this ritual. And these rituals are supposed to be pointing you to the importance of asking God for forgiveness. It is pointing you to, to come to God in humility. And the sad part about the Pharisees is that they failed to understand the reason for all these ritual cleansings. They thought that these cleansings were just simply rules that they have to obey to the letter. That's why they were very peculiar about making sure that they follow all these ritualistic cleansings but they never actually take time to deal with what is in the inside you see these external cleansings were to point them to the re the reason for this external cleansing is to point them to the importance of making sure that what's inside is actually clean but the Israelites they stop with the external cleansings and that is all my sisters Look at verse 25 and 26 again. Jesus first described them as a cup and a dish. And Jesus Christ says, you know what? On the outside, you may be clean. You may be clean because you've been cleaning the outside of your cup, of your dish. But inside is full of greed and indulgence. And Jesus Christ was actually referring to the Israelites or to the Pharisees or the teachers of the law. He was saying, guess what? You are this cup. You are this dish. On the outside, you may look very clean, but you actually fail to clean what is inside. You see, a cup, the, the usefulness of the cup is very much, uh, rel, uh, very much reliant upon how clean the inside is, not the outside. It's the same with the dish. You don't put your food on the outside of the dish or you don't put your food on the opposite side of your plate you put your food on the right side of the plate you put your water on the inner part of the cup and that's why those parts have to be clean and here's the problem jesus christ was telling them first clean the inside of the cup and dish then the outside will be clean as well i don't know if you've ever cleaned cups or dishes um when we were in college we uh being a pharmacist we we deal with a lot of test tubes and probably one, that's one of the equipments that we are using that is really very hard to clean because when you use these test tubes and um and do experiments on them there will be a lot of remnants there will be a lot of um things that would stick to the 
to the bottom of your test tubes and it's very hard to clean that's why we would have to, we were required to have our test tube brushes these are very long and um long and thin uh, test tube brushes this would go deep into the test tube to be able to reach the lowest part of the test tube to clean it and the funny thing is you don't even have to clean the outside because the mere fact that you were cleaning the inside the water is flowing, the, the soap is flowing, and when you clean the inside, the outside automatically becomes clean. So Jesus Christ was saying, if you clean the inside, guess what? The outside will also be clean naturally because water will be flowing from the inside out. And it's very interesting because the second illustration that Jesus used was altogether very different. It's no longer cups and dishes but this time he was referring to them like whitewash tombs whitewash tombs on the outside it looks beautiful but on the inside it's full of dead men's bones and everything unclean and this time jesus christ is saying you cannot clean them anymore unlike the cup and the the cup and the dishes you can still clean them but whitewash tombs what you have inside are dead men's bones and Jesus Christ is saying, these Pharisees, they're actually dead on the inside. They don't have a relationship with God. They are dead on the inside. And that's why there's all sorts of wickedness flowing within them. Wickedness and um, hypocrisy. Look at what Jesus went on to say. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness that's the problem with the pharisees people look at them and they seem like they are floating on air with a halo over the head but in reality what's inside is more important remember what jesus said on another instance he said it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean but it's what actually comes out from within you that makes you unclean and it's exactly what Jesus Christ is saying. Because what is in your heart, sooner or later, they will flow out of your life. If what is inside is unclean, if what is inside is dead, full of dead men's bones, sooner or later, it will come out. If what's inside is full of anger, sooner or later, it will come out. If what's inside is full of envy and bitterness, sooner or later, those will come out. You may appear good on the outside, but sooner or later, all that will come out. And that's why Jesus Christ is saying, forget about the outward appearances. Focus on the heart. Focus on what's inside. Cleanse what is inside. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to take away this wickedness within you. But take note that many times we fall into the trap of superficial appearances. Why? Because first and foremost, we are lazy. We are lazy. You see, it's very hard to develop what is inside. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to deal with your anger. It takes a lot of time to deal with your bitterness. It takes a lot of time and humility to deal with everything that's going on within. And that's why we don't deal with what's inside. We just simply deal with what is outward appearances. Why? Because we are lazy. And the outward is easy to clean. We just simply put on a new piece of clothing. We are properly wash clothing and that's it. Washing your clothes is just, it just takes an hour at least. And then taking a bath. 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and you're done. You're clean. You're good as new on the outside. But you see, dealing with what's inside, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort to constantly remind yourself, I have to control my anger. I have to control my bitterness. I have to deal with this. I have to deal with all of this. My sisters, we are living... Um, examples of this because a lot of times honestly speaking many of us we are lazy dealing with what is inside we focus on the outward appearances we come to church with all smiles with um with beautiful clothings 
properly made up make up faces faces that have been made up and you see we neglect what is inside much like the pharisees did next the bible tells us uh, the reason that we fall into the trap of superficial appearances is because we don't value what people can't see and appreciate we don't value what people cannot see and appreciate you see people cannot see what's inside as long as i can pretend to be something good outward and people see what's outward and that's it we are living in a generation where tiktok is really something very prominent in our generation today and it's very interesting because these tiktokers these vloggers um there's a facebook post about all these who are pretending who are just simply putting up a front we become so used to people who are pretending to just be someone else on camera so that people would appreciate them they put on beautiful picture beautiful faces they put on beautiful clothings and basically they have thousands hundreds of thousands millions of followers simply because they look good and these people because they don't have any connection with them they don't care about what's really going on within them and that's why a lot of times we don't focus on what's inside we don't value what people cannot see and what people cannot appreciate that's why we put a lot of emphasis on the outward appearances but we don't deal with what is inside next we don't think much of god's pleasure we don't care whether god is pleased or not and that's why we just focus on superficial appearances remember what the bible says god says that man, uh, god does not look at men the way men looks because men looks at the outward appearances but god looks at the heart and basically what god cares more is what is inside not our outward appearances and the reason we don't focus on what's inside is because we don't think much about god's pleasure we think more about what people want rather than what god really wants of us brown sisters be careful that you do not fall into the trap of these pharisees who put on a very righteous front but with inside them is full of wickedness brown sisters a lot of times we claim ourselves to be christians but when no one is looking when no one sees what we are doing when we are in the confines of our rooms are we still christians are we still acting the way god expects us to act when no one sees us and all this has to do with our integrity all this has to do with our integrity brothers don't fall into the trap that the pharisees have fallen into they have become people pleasers rather than god pleasers and lastly jesus said that they are offended by the real thing look at matthew chapter 23. in matthew chapter 23 verse 29 to 30 jesus said woe to you teachers of the law and pharisees you hypocrites you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous and you say if we had lived in the days of our forefathers we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets they were bragging we are not like our fathers our fathers they kill the prophets but we we are not like them if we had lived during their time we would have we would not have taken part in killing these prophets in fact we would probably have defended these prophets you see we have built these beautiful tombs for our prophets we have built monuments and statues for these prophets we are not like our fathers and yet jesus said you testify against yourself that you are the descendants of those who murdered prophets you are their descendants and you will be like them you will fill up the measure of the sin of your forefathers you will continue to do what they have been doing look at what jesus said therefore i am sending you prophets and teachers prophets wise men and teachers some of them you will kill and crucify others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town take time to think about this 
Verse 34 is actually a prophecy from Jesus Christ. Look at what Jesus is saying. A time will come that he will send prophets and wise men and teachers into Israel again. And guess what? These Pharisees will kill them, will crucify them. They will flog them in their synagogues. They will pursue them from town to town. Isn't that what happened? Because in a matter of days from Matthew chapter 23, Jesus would actually be crucified on the cross. And later on, we will find that every follower of Jesus Christ will be hunted down. The followers of Jesus Christ will be put to death. They will be persecuted. The Apostle Paul, who himself was a Pharisee, was hunting people down, hunting Christians and killing them. And when he became a Christian himself, he was also hunted down, he was also crucified, he was also flogged, he was also persecuted, and ultimately he was also crucified upside down according to, to our church history. And brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is saying, guess what? You are threatened. You are threatened by the real thing because you are fake. You are fake. You pretend to be righteous. And so when the real thing comes along and people get to see the real thing, you are threatened. You are threatened and therefore you go on the offensive. You persecute these people who are true to themselves. You persecute these people who are doing what is right because when they continue doing what is right, you will be exposed for the fake that you are. That's why these Pharisees, they went around killing people because they don't like these people. They don't like these prophets who are telling people what they need to hear because the Pharisees, they simply want to condemn these people. These Pharisees, they want simply to elevate themselves over everyone else so that they will gain the respect of the people. So when people come and threatening their positions, they start, of, they start persecuting them. Prophets, wise men, teachers, apostles, Jesus Christ were flogged, persecuted, and crucified. My sisters, Jesus reminds us, do not be like them. Do not be like them. If someone righteous comes along and you, you begin to see just how, how much of a fake you are. Because, that's, because unless the right thing comes along, what is fake is hard to detect. But when the right thing comes along, the fake one is exposed. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is telling them, instead of killing these prophets, instead of persecuting these real Christians, these real righteous men of God, become like them. Become like them. Learn to emulate from them. Do not be jealous of them. Do not be angry at them for your failures, but rather learn to emulate why was Jesus angry with the Pharisees? First, they became hindrances to people's salvation. People were no longer coming to God because they have become obstacles to the people. They are zealous for all the wrong reasons. They were leading people not to God but rather to their own traditions and turning these people to become like them. And they love to play around with the rules. As long as they can get away with it, they will try to get away with it. For they were selective in their obedience. What they don't want to follow, they don't follow. What they don't want to obey, they don't obey. And they just simply, um, they simply ease their consciences by assuring themselves that we're doing other laws, which are not as important. Their righteousness is all but an act. They're just simply putting up a facade. They're just simply putting up a facade so that people will continue to respect them because if the people see what is really going on in their hearts, people will be disgusted with them. And so they put up a front where that people can, can love. They put up a front that could um, deceive the people into thinking that they are better 
than they really are. And lastly, they're offended by the real thing. When Jesus Christ came along, they were shot. They were threatened. When the Apostle Paul started preaching about Jesus Christ, this once who was a Pharisee was now preaching about Jesus Christ, they were offended, they were threatened. And they started killing off these people. My sisters, it is my prayer that we will not become like the Pharisees. First and foremost, we need to understand we have to have a right relationship with God. That's the problem with the Pharisees. They were so engrossed in their traditions that God was no longer a part of what they were doing. They were just simply keeping the rules for the sake of keeping the rules. But as Christians, we need to understand that first and foremost, the Ten Commandments tells us that you shall have no other gods besides me. The first and most important commandment is that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And Jesus Christ is reminding us, all these rituals, all these traditions, all these things that the Pharisees deem important, suddenly they fall short simply because they have neglected God in, in following their traditions. My sisters, make sure that you are right with God. Make sure that you are right with God. Secondly, nurture the inner life. Nurture the inner life. Because what you are inside, sooner or later, it will be reflected outwardly. It will be reflected on the outside. Nurture what is inside. Nurture what is inside. When you nurture what is inside, it will flow out from your heart. It will naturally flow out from your heart. My sisters, the Pharisees, they focus on the outside, but they never allowed the Word of God to change their hearts. They were very quick to point at the mistake of others, but they never saw the mistakes in their own hearts. And that's why Jesus said, Woe to you! Woe to you, 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 and woe to you. Masters, it is my prayer that as we understand the anger, the rebuke that Jesus had for these Pharisees, may we not become like the Pharisees. May we become like the Apostle Paul who saw the error of his ways, who saw the error of the pharisaical way, that he jumped both, that he willingly change his life in order to be right with God. It's not too late, brothers and sisters. Whatever situation you are in, if you are playing with hypocrisy today, if you are just simply putting up a front in your words, in your mouth, you may act like a Christian. But you are far from God. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, it's never too late. Draw near to God. The Bible says, when you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. When you humble yourself before the Lord, He will lift you up. This is found in James chapter 4. And it's my prayer that as Christians, we will indeed focus on our relationship with God. And we would indeed nurture what is inside us. So that we will continue to grow in our love for God. And we would be real. We would be true. We would not be hypocrites just like the Pharisees. Resisters, why don't we come to the Lord in prayer today? Father, we thank you, Father, for these reminders. Indeed, Father, if we take time to quiet down our hearts and souls, we understand that there is a part of us that still enjoys being a hypocrite. A part of us that we would not allow others to see and we simply put up a front so that people will think that we are better than we really are that we are more spiritual than we really are that we are more righteous and godly than we really are father i thank you father because you see what is hidden in the from the eyes of the people you see the deepest recesses of my heart you see the dirt, the skeletons. You see the wickedness in my heart. 
And Father, it is my prayer that even as you un as you 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 see us as an open book, may may we understand, Father, that before you we don't have to pretend. That before you we can come just as we are, sinners, before a holy God, a loving God. A God who is ready to accept us if we would just but repent. A God who would be ready to receive us if we would just but turn our backs on our sins. Father, forgive us because a lot of times indeed it is easier to just simply play Christian, act like a Christian, when in fact we are really Christians. Father, forgive us. Forgive us if we just settle with saying the right words. We just settle with acting a certain way, even though our hearts are very far from you. It is my prayer, Father, that you would forgive us. And it is my prayer, Father, that once again you would allow your spirit to continue to open up our hearts to us, to reveal our hypocrisy to us, that we may understand what needs to be corrected in our lives. Father, forgive us, Father. And it's my prayer, Father, that indeed the truth will set us free. That indeed we would be able to stand before you and surrender every part of our heart to you. That we no longer need to be ashamed. That we no longer need to hide a portion of who we are. And it is my prayer, Father, that we will not just be sincere and real before you, but we will also be sincere and real before the people around us. Indeed, Father, we have lost so much influence with the unbelievers simply because so many Christians have been hypocrites for so long. That Christians have become unbelievable. Christians have become un untrustworthy. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us if we have put your name to shame simply because we pretend to be better than what we really are. Father, this morning we continue to ask, Father, for forgiveness. And we ask that you would help us to really devote our time into nurturing our inner life. That we would spend time with you to develop our relationship with you every day of our life, that we will not be like the Pharisees and simply neglect the inner life. Father, I commit each one of us into your hands, Father. It is my prayer that none of us will be found hypocrites and none of us will be found un uh, disqualified from entering heaven. Because like the Pharisees, some of us may actually be dead men walking, whitewashed tomb, but inside we are spiritually dead, without any relationship with God. It is my prayer, Father, that if we are dead inside, may you help us to seek answers. May you help us to find salvation in Christ that we may be reborn spiritually. Father, we also want to lift up, Father, our church once again into your hands. Bless our church, Father. And bless our members. It is my prayer, Father, that we would continue to strive to be better, not just superficially, but more importantly, from the inside out, O oh Lord. That we would develop, we would focus on our disciplines so that we would be nurturing our inner life, Lord. Father, I continue to commit each one of us into your hands. Bless us, O Lord. And we continue to commit into prayer the Reyes family. We pray, Father, for Ati Laura, for um, Dick, as they are COVID positive right now. We pray even, Father, for the rest of the family that they will not be affected by this. We pray, Father, that they would be able to recover soon. We thank you, Father, that um, every day they're getting better and better. The symptoms are diminishing. 
Uh, but we pray, Father, for complete recovery for them. We pray for Mr. Fabro as well, Father, even as um, uh, the COVID-19 um, left him very weak. We pray, Father, that you would continue to strengthen him. You would continue to help him recover the strength that he lost. Um, and I pray, Father, that indeed he would get back that uh, vigor that he once had, O oh Lord. Father, we also want to lift up in prayer the family of our Pastor Danny Balete. Even as you have taken him to be with you, I pray, Father, for the family that has been left behind. May you continue to comfort them, especially his two kids who are just in college, O oh Lord. I pray, Father, for um, your provisions. I pray, Father, for your um, comfort upon this family, that your love will continue to surround this family and provide for this family, O oh Lord. Father, we continue to commit, Father, um, our church once again into your hands, O oh Lord. Bless our church. Continue to use this church to be an instrument of your grace and continue to use us, Father, that we may continue to be a channel of blessing to everyone around us. Father, once again, we thank you. We give you all the glory. May you continue to use us, Father, for your glory and honor that others may come to know Jesus Christ through us. That when they come to meet us, Father, they will not find a hypocrite, but a true believer who lives out what he believes. And it is my prayer, Father, that this would be true of all of us. Once again, Father, I thank you. I give you all the glory. In the mighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. My sisters, once again, a blessed Sunday to each and every one of you. And it's my prayer that you would continue to keep safe and continue to follow our IATF protocols. Once again, I, I bid each and every one of you a happy Sunday. God bless.